Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Almighty God, there is nothing that we experience in this human life that you have not walked those miles on our behalf. Father, we thank you for this day as we begin this holy season of Lent when we remember the wandering of the Israelites for 40 years, the temptation of Jesus in the desert for 40 days, as we begin our own season of reflection and penitence and sobriety and thoughtfulness. Father, may we look to Jesus and find him indeed mighty to save. You know our manifold temptations. You understand us, Lord. And yet you call us to be so much more than we are by the power of your spirit, to be those who are full of you and who pour you out wherever we go. Lord, as we heard those words of exhortation, we cannot help but think about the times we fail. Lord, this morning, forgive us and empower us all the more day by day to bear the light of Jesus into the world around us. This morning, Father, I pray that every word out of my mouth and the meditation of every heart in this room be pleasing to you, acceptable to you, as we depend upon you as rock and redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> so most of you know that this past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. It's the first day of that 40-day season of fasting and penitence that we call Lent. I imagine that most of you probably walked around all day with a smudge on your forehead, or you told people that they had missed a spot before you remembered that it was Ash Wednesday and you, Slacker, had missed out on services. Uh, but that smudge was a reminder uh, that I am dust and that you are dust and that dust is our future. Even if you didn't receive ashes or see them with your own eyes that day, you and I live in a world full of ashes. We know that the leading cause of human death is human birth, birth into a world corrupted by human sin. Now to be sure, it was not our Creator's intention that we would have to number our days. Indeed, in the garden, we would have lived forever, drawn close as we were to the source of light and life. But disobedience and pride shattered the perfection of that Edenic life. And so here we are, Thousands and generations later, with ashes on our foreheads, faced with our mortality. Lent is a season of fasting and penitence in which we ponder the truth of our mortality. So that when the joy of Easter arrives with its news that God has answered death with life, that he has answered our ashes with the resurrection of Jesus, we might experience all the more fully the great salvation wrought by our Savior Christ. Lent is all about not taking your salvation for granted. My prayer is that this Lent would be what Lent is supposed to be for you and me both. A time of reflection, of sober reflection, that leads to joy all the more abundant when we get to the end of it, and we celebrate the empty tomb. But if you happen to be here at Christ Church on Wednesday, you will have heard me confess to the congregation gathered that I'm not feeling very Lenten this Lent. I'm already fully into the joy of Easter because in my own life, in the life of Christ Church, I'm kind of giddy about the exciting things that are happening in our midst. I'm thrilled by the many good things that God is bringing our way these days. On the one hand, our favorite son, Father Morgan Clark, is about to become a rector at a sister church in our diocese. And on the other hand, the Lord has seen fit to drop the 22 acres and three gorgeous buildings that his southern homes and gardens into our lap and when we least expected it. And the possibilities seem rather endless to us. And yet, Lent is here. And whether you are giddy over the good things in life or 
if you are weighed down with burdens that are too great for you to bear. Lent gives us all the same invitation to get a little bit quieter. At Christ Church, we change our liturgy, liturgy, liturgies a bit to help us remind us that things are different. Our music is a little quieter. It's full of minor keys. We start our service by chanting the Ten Commandments and begging God to forgive us for the ways that we violate them on a far too regular basis. You won't hear bells ringing today or the word hallelujah until we get to Easter and so on and so forth. But there are other ways in which we might set in our lives a tone of sobriety for the 40 days of Lent. So that the 50 days of feasting, which comes afterwards in Easter, might be a feast for us indeed. Some of us might fast from entertainment and feast a little bit more on God's word. Others might fast from a particular pastime or pleasure of certain food or drink or thing you love to do. So that we might feast a little bit more on times of prayer and quietude before the Lord. Some of us might fast from self-indulgence, so that we might feast a bit more on spending time with the lonely or the poor. The possibilities for Lent really are many, but I think the need to find something to do to mark the season is important. For we all need some added quiet in our way too busy, far too loud world. For me, I'm trying to carve out some time for quiet thankfulness amidst all my giddiness. And so in the morning, when I'm driving the boys to school, we listen to a podcast of Anglican morning prayer. And as we drive, quietly listening and praying and listening to scripture being read, I'm trying to let my heart have a, a spirit of quiet thankfulness. Thankfulness both for the specific things that God is up to at Christ Church and in my life, but more generally for the good news of the gospel of Jesus as he saved me, miserable sinner that I am. We're going to focus this morning on that reading from 1 Peter 3, because I think these words from Peter give us an invitation to quiet thankfulness and also that hint of full-blown joyousness over the news of what Jesus has done for us. And really, I, we're not going to get much further than just verse 18, because just in that short few words, I can see at least five things, just in a surface reading of that verse, that spark me to quiet joy. First, we find Jesus identifying with us. Peter tells us that Jesus suffered, and he suffered for us. And that means that there is no pain, there is no struggle, there is no sorrow that you can know in this earthly life that Jesus does not understand. You are never alone. And in the quiet of your heart, know that your Savior has experienced all that you experience. And he identifies with all your struggles and all of mine. And because he gets us, he will never, ever abandon us. Second, the suffering of our Savior does more than just show that he gets us, as a recent ad tells us that he does, because his suffering was for sins, which means that his suffering and his death was an act of atonement. It literally means at one minute. We are separated from God, and yet... The suffering of the righteous one brings us back to God. The things that separated us, he has mended. In the quiet of your heart this Lent, remember that Jesus died to pay the price for my sins and yours. And he has made it possible for us to be at one with God again. And because his spirit can dwell in one, for whom sins have been atoned, then his spirit can live inside of me and help me live according to his commandments. Third, the suffering of our Savior was something that the righteous one did 
for those who were unrighteous. He suffered for your sins and for mine while we were still wretched in our sins. While we were unrighteous, the one who was perfectly righteous was willing to suffer for us. So he didn't do it because you earned it. He didn't do it because somehow I had done enough good stuff in this life to merit it. He did it because he loves you and he loves me. In the quiet of your heart, remember that God so loved the world, which includes you, that he gave his son to die for you just when you least deserved it. Fourth, the suffering of the righteous one on the cross for the sins of the unrighteous brought us, who are unrighteous, back to God. And so here we hear this word of reconciliation. The death of Jesus on the cross was an act that reconciles us to God. It's a legal term. It means that in the great ledger book of life, you were marked for death. And now by no fault of your own, no merit of your own, you have been moved into the ledger of life. We could not make that change on our own. We could not bring ourselves back to God. We were stuck in our ashes. So God comes among us to reconcile us to him, all out of love. In the quiet of your heart this Lent, See that the enmity that existed between God and me and God and you because of our sin, that enmity has been vanquished by the reconciling love of Jesus. Fifth, Peter tells us that our suffering Savior was put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. That means that Jesus' sacrifice and his mighty resurrection are acts that will change us if we will merely let them transform us. For if we share in Jesus' death through baptism, the promise is that he will raise us to new life by the spirit that comes to dwell within us. In the quiet of your heart this Lent, remember if you were here and you were baptized, then you have been buried in death with Jesus. And you're washed and made clean and raised to new life in Jesus. And that means that your call is not to warm a pew at a church, but rather to go out into the world activated for ministry, bringing the blessing of Jesus to a world full of ashes all around you. You and, I are, you and I are now the bearers of the Spirit of God, and we're the ones who bring the light of our resurrected Lord into the darkness of the world. And this is news of full-blown joy. May we shine forth the glory of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, most of you, oh, I just skipped a page. Excuse me. Off, off script. Desperately off script. Page seven is missing. What did I say on that page? Well, I know what I was going to say. Uh, there are two other things in that passage that I don't have time to really get into, but I can't not say them. The first reminds us that what Jesus did for us on the cross transcends time. And in some mysterious way, we hear Peter saying that even those who disobeyed in the, in the time of the flood that saving grace of God somehow mysteriously is for theirs to hear as well. And the second thing that the rest of 1 Peter 3, that passage today, speaks to is the fact that baptism reminds you of the flood. And, you know, even our architecture reminds us of that, right? You look up and you see those vast beams of the church, like you are in the ark of the church, and you're washed in those waters that wipe sin off the face of the planet. But when you come out of the ark, you come out into a new world that's been made new by what God has done for us in Jesus. This passage from 1 Peter 3 is really overwhelming in its content. In fact, we do believe that it might have been an early 
confession of the church. And that what Peter was reminding them is something that they sung every Sunday or said aloud and chanted in church as a reminder of the thing that gives us joy. So most of you probably saw that ad of the Super Bowl about how Jesus gets us. In it, we are shown images of men and women washing the feet of those who are their enemies across a wide range of political and moral divides. And a lot of ink has been spilled over the, whether the ad was good or bad and about how Jesus did indeed intend to wash feet, but also to call sinners back to new lives of repentance. And I don't want to wade too deeply into that controversy from this pulpit. But I will say that while it is worth celebrating that Jesus gets us, indeed, Peter tells us that he suffered for us, does get us, it's even more worthy to celebrate that he saves us. He brings us out of sin into new life. And all we have to do is repent, and he will give us lives of quiet hope and exceeding great joy. So my friends, it is Lent. Please tell me to quiet down when I'm getting too loud. It is okay for us to feel giddy over what God is up to. But it's also good to be still and wait for him. Because he so loved you and he so loved me. That he died for our sins. That he promises to teach us how to move from the old life of sin into the new life of my prayer is that these days leading up to Easter will be a treasured time in which we learn more and more how to serve God who first washed us and made us clean. Amen? Please stand as we affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God.